question and then we'll ask the person to answer. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Martin. My question is very simple. But first, commend the speakers for what they've said. Here is my question. Where in both religions are we going to end? Is there a future? Or this is it in terms of life? Does, do the two religions, Christianity and Islam, do they have a destination? Or do I just believe and I end up here and I rot? And that's the end. All right, thank you. That's a good question. The question is from both John and Yusuf. What is the destination? What is the future? So perhaps uh, John can tell us what is the destination and future of Christianity, and Yusuf can tell us what is the end, what is the future, the destination of Islam. Thank you, John. Well, for me, the Christian faith and the Christian belief teaches me that this life here is a journey. We are on a journey, and the destination is not this earth. The destination is somewhere else that we Christians call heaven and that you have to be saved in order to get to heaven. And so, yes, you might, be, you might be enjoying and feeling that you have a wonderful life here, but this is just, as I say sometimes to my, 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 my students, this is just a marketplace, and we are here for a moment. So if you pitch your camp here in this world, you pitch your camp in the wrong place. If you feel that you are, you, it, this place is horrible for you, and you're sitting here and you're mourning in this world, this is not the end of it. There is a destination. There's an ultimate destination, destination that we believe, and I think that you will agree with this, that both Muslims and Christians, there's an afterlife. And that's one of the things that Christians and Islam share in common, that there's an afterlife. And there's going to be a judgment and a day of accountability. For us Christians, Jesus is the, the way, the truth, and the life to that destination, and that is what we believe. Thank you, John. Yusuf? Yeah, I think in part um, I would agree with the fact, in a limited sense, that certainly we're all looking for salvation. We're all looking for the eternal salvation for all of us. But I think this is where the point differs. Firstly, as I explained in my discussion, and I think John also raised the objection to it, why I wanted to go through all the other faiths is that I wanted to emphasize and illustrate the fact that none of these faiths are complete holistic worldviews. Even Christianity was something which was nationalistic and evolved at a particular point in time. Even the earliest dated Gospels, the Uspensky Gospels, date to the 7th or 8th century 200 years after the Quran was revealed. But coming back to the question about what's the ultimate destination, there are two for one is to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth. In other words, to make society and living just and moral. It happens, for example, from the time you leave your house and you go to the mosque and the church, or the church, and you see yourself enmeshed in a society where there's poverty, where there's a sense of deprivation, where there's a sense of sanguinary warfare, and you just come to the church or you go to the mosque and you do nothing about your society around you. And therefore, part of the spiritual quest in Islam is to concern yourself with regards to the environment. Part of the spiritual quest in Islam is to confront the injustices that affect society. To a large extent, Christianity by and large doesn't accept that because, in a sense, you have the you have the verse, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and rent unto God the things that are God's. So in other words, more or less happy to, es to accept the established social order as it exists, and Islam doesn't do that. Islam makes a stand in terms of justice, in terms of morality, in terms of social upliftment of the masses. In respect of salvation, I think both the Quran and the Bible are ofe and similar and parallel on this, and I quote the Bible because it fulfills the Islamic particular teachings. If you look at Ezekiel 18.20, it says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But it doesn't stop there. It says, The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But in conclusion, if the wicked will turn from all the evil that he has done, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. That is Islam. You pay for your sins, I pay for my sins. Otherwise, we believe somebody's parking ticket or somebody's pen, I steal it, and Jesus pays for that, what has he done? But for Hitler's sins, on account of him, 20 million people got killed in the Second World War, and Jesus pays for that, now that is something. For Peter Sutcliffe, he raped and ripped 13 women, and Jesus pays for that, that is something. 
What kind of philosophy is that where Jimmy Swaggart will say, the greater the sin, the greater the redemption. Rather go back to the teachings of Jesus, go back to the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, where Jesus would say, verily I say unto you, that except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. You can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you engage in faith and righteous action. All this right. idea of simply believing that somebody came Yourself and died for your sins an is a later development. Yeah, I just, wanted comment? To, yeah, I just wanted to quickly say that uh, I think Yusuf is so fixated with quoting from scripture. Yusuf, you just, you just need to open your eyes and look around. I'm in South Africa here. You tell me that Christianity doesn't believe in social change, in political change. I don't think you can tell this Desmond Tutu in South Africa here. Christians believe in social change. Christians believe in transformation. It is very good for you to just quote scripture. But I'm saying, open your eyes, Yusuf, and look around you. Look around the world. No Christian will tell you that Jesus died for Hitler. No Christian tells you that. So it's, it is, it is, it is, it is. I, I think it is beyond you to quote those. Things. But but let's just just, just on one point, uh, John. I want to ask you a question. Let's assume Hitler killed six million Jews, and on his deathbed or before he died, he accepted Christ as his savior. Would Jesus be saved? Would Would Hitler be saved? If Hitler on his deathbed, after having killed six million Jews, twelve million people, and he accepts Christ as his savior, would G would Hitler be saved? Because if you are saying he'll be saved, then are you saying that the lives of 12 million murdered individuals are so cheap? You, you, you are asking me a hypothetical question. What if he did? If, what if he did? If it didn't happen. But if he did, but would he be happen. saved? If he did, would he be saved? And I'm saying it didn't happen. So, so what has Jesus, right. Jesus paid for? Thank you, gentlemen. What has Jesus paid for? Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Let me answer that question. What is he Thank you, John. No, no, no.